But to keep the peace with conservatives, King Faisal made Saudi Arabia a sanctuary for extremist Muslims from abroad. When governments in Egypt and Syria cracked down on fundamentalist religious scholars, King Faisal invited them to teach Saudi Arabian youth. Faisal's decision had far-reaching consequences. There was an influx of them here, and where did they work? They worked in the education and in other professional works, and that's when the problem started here. Many of today's Saudi radicals studied under Egyptian and Syrian fundamentalists. They misused their hospitality. They dealt with we dealt with them honestly, and they and they dealt with that un, un, with us under, underhandedly. And uh, that is a mistake that's not going to be repeated. This is a tremendously important point. In order to avoid the nationalism, what they saw as radicalism that had swept through Egypt under Gamal Abdel Nasser in the 1950s, the Saudi royal family was willing to take into Saudi Arabia radical, dissident Islamists from places like Egypt, Syria, Jordan, Iraq bring them into Saudi Arabia and provide them with a safe haven, the consequences of which eventually were 9-11. Fifteen of the 19 hijackers were, of course, Saudi citizens. Religious conservatives staged one of their biggest protests in 1965 when Faisal approved TV broadcasts in the kingdom. They consider that broadcasting t television is a sin and against, uh, because they consider them to be images. And we are not supposed to show images. And they consider that this was uh, rank heresy and that the government had become uh, in league with the devil. <laughs> so what he did is he had somebody recite the Quran and broadcast that and told people, you see this, it's like a sword. You can use a sword for good, or you can use a sword to assassinate. So it's a tool, really. It's like the internet today, the same debate goes on. A nephew of the king sided with religious conservatives. It would eventually have drastic personal consequences. One of Faisal's brother's sons staged a demonstration, Prince Khalid ibn Saad, in 1965. And uh, this demonstration was objecting to the introduction of television on the basis that it was un-Islamic. A group of people got together, not numbering more than a hundred. They headed towards the, the television tower in, in Riyadh and tried to break in to bring down the television tower. They fired at the guards, the guards fired back, and the prince was killed. The father then went to Faisal and said, uh, you've got to punish the soldier who killed my son. And Faisal said, no, uh, I'm sorry your son was killed, but he was breaking the law. He fired on the police, they fired back at him, and the policeman is guiltless. I am responsible. Then in March 1975, his past caught up with him. My father was uh, receiving uh, the then Minister of Petroleum of Kuwait. He was followed into the room by a nephew of the king. The king's nephew, Prince Faisal bin Musad, came to take his revenge. It was his brother who had been killed by police during the 1965 TV tower demonstration. Remember the TV thing? Uh, and this guy was a little nuts anyway, of booze and all kinds of stuff. And there's the guards and everybody, they don't know the kid. They think he's part of the entourage from Kuwait. When uh, the minister bowed to say hello to the king, um, he uh, took out a pistol and, and shot the king over the shoulder of the, of the, of the minister. King Faisal's assassination came as a violent shock. 
especially that the assassin was a family member. But the succession had already been decided. Well, what have we learned? We began with the founder of the dynasty, the patriarch, Abdul Aziz ibn Saud. 1932, he declares himself king of a new kingdom. He names after himself Saudi Arabia. His successor and eldest son, Saud, a failure. But only partially a failure, because even through his incompetence and alcohol abuse, the Saudi royal family remains in control of the country and in control of the oil. With Faisal, there is competence at the top, and Saudi Arabia modernizes. If we look at these magazine covers, we see that on two of them, oil is a prominent feature, and that is because obviously Saudi Arabia and oil are inextricably linked. As we move forward in this lecture series and in this class, we'll consistently see just how large a role oil plays, has played, and continues to play today and into the future. Next time, in the second lecture of the Saudi Arabia lecture series, we'll look at the money behind the family. The source of the money behind the family, I should say, oil. Aramco is the Saudi National Oil Company. National only in as much as it is owned not by the people of Saudi Arabia, but rather by the Saudi royal family. The final lecture in this lecture series will look at what, it, what it's like to be, say, 22 years old, to live in Saudi Arabia, grown up in Saudi Arabia. What do you do for fun? Well, that'll be the last lecture. Next time, oil.